I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hi, everybody out there. Ken Davenport here. Welcome back to the Producer's Perspective podcast. Thank you for tuning in. I could do a very long introduction for today's guest, or I could just say three letters. NBC. Yep, that's right, ladies and gentle listeners. Welcome the chairman of NBC Entertainment, Mr. Robert Greenblatt. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Ken, and please call me Bob. Thank you. Uh, so, Bob, yes. uh, you're the chairman of one of the largest television networks in the free world, which <laughs> frankly is a little mind boggling to me, that kind of position, and I'm sure to a lot of people out there listening. What was your path to getting where you were? I mean, were you watching episodes of The Cosby Show as a kid going, one day I'm going to be chairman of that network? You know, it's funny. I never really thought much about television when I was uh, growing up in Rockford, Illinois. I always wanted to be a movie executive. I was very taken with the idea of movie studios and kind of going behind the scenes of you know how movies are made. And studios were just fascinating to me as kind of their own worlds. And... Uh, I always loved television, but it wasn't, I didn't grow up like Brandon Tartikoff making my own scheduling board and moving pieces around. Uh, for me, it was movies. And so I went to LA and went to film school and uh, came out of film school in the, you know, in the mid 80s at a time when film was all important, when television was sort of the bastard stepchild and television was a lesser form back then. If you were anything, you were in the film business. And, uh, that's sort of how I looked at it. And uh, I had a quick first job in the film business out of film school. And then that, you know, turned into a television job just by accident. And at the time, I thought, why, why do I want to go into television? And, uh, you know, that was 1989. And I've never been in the film business since. So I've uh, really loved being in TV. And it's transformed incredibly in the last 25 years. It is now the preferred medium, I think, and many people in the film business will tell you that. Um, you know, film is still what it is, but television, there's a golden age. There's never been more great, you know, programming, especially drama programming. And everybody in the film world is now crossing over into TV, which is not the case, you know, 25 years ago when I started first started doing this. So that was the strange route to television, completely unexpected, and uh, here I am. And why do you think you've seen, well, we've seen this resurgence of television? Is it because television, for the most part, is a free service? And in the world of free on-demand video on YouTube, wherever, we can still get it somewhat for free on a... Well, uh, you know, te television is, is free. Certainly, we offer it free um, if you want to look at advertising. But, you know, television also costs a lot if you're even a subscriber to, to Netflix or, you know cable subscriber, you're, you're paying for it. I, I think it's really more about the form has just matured and it's a, it's a way to tell stories and develop characters over long periods of time. You don't have to just compress it into you know, a two hour movie experience. So lots of film writers have explored the longer sort of form of storytelling coupled with the fact that the film business, the economics are just out of control and you know, you walk out the door at a, with a film and it's $100 million, or, you know, a, a big blockbuster is $250 million or $300 million. So the studios are, you know, much more reticent to gamble on, you know, Terms of Endearment or All the President's Men or Tootsie, you know, show, movies that, you know, used to be made all the time, uh, The Sting. And now it's, big action adventure sort of superhero movies or you know teenage male comedies the art films get made in between there but I think a lot of writers have found that television is where you can really develop a, a great story and characters whether it's on cable or or network or now on these digital streaming platforms so before you were at NBC, you were at Showtime, and you supervised the creation and development of some incredible shows there, including Dexter and Weeds. Can you describe the development process for a television show compared to the development process for a play or a musical? Is it similar? Uh, you know, 
sure, there's similarities. Obviously, you're working with creators who are struggling to find their, you know, their show. In television, it's just accelerated. You, we're in a sort of, it's almost a factory mentality. The, the broadcast networks are, are just voluminous in terms of number of shows. Cable has a more luxurious pace because there's only a, a handful of new shows, so we, you can sort of take more time and, and, and develop something more thoroughly. But you're on a cycle, and every year you go through a cycle, and you make pilots, and you make series, and you sort of just keep plugging ahead. So I would say the tempo is a lot faster in television, and, uh, but it's, it's all the same. You know, uh, we don't have to, you know, try things out. We're not spending other people's money. You know, we're not raising money uh, like you do in the theater. We're spending our own money. And, uh, you know, the sort of tryout in television is, is the pilot or the stages that you might go through um, before you pull the trigger on a series. The economics are vastly different. But I think the failure rate's probably similar. You know, there's a lot of failure in, uh, in any medium, in any artistic medium. Um, and, and rare are the, you know, the Sopranos or the Six Feet Unders or the, the Voices, where every now and then something really breaks through. But, you know, the process of, of finding a show is as, as difficult, regardless of, of what medium you're in, I think. It's, I've never thought about it. The, the pilot process is much like our workshop process. Right. And it just costs millions of dollars. <laughs> but yes, yes. And how many of those, so how many pilots will you do a year that don't get on the air? Uh, well, it depends on where you are. If you're, in a, if you're in a cable network where the numbers are all smaller, you'll make a few pilots. Maybe a couple pilots won't go to series, but you know, so many fewer shows are put forward in cable that you make fewer pilots and you waste fewer pilots. In the network game, we're filling hours and hours of original programming per week. In cable, it's maybe a couple hours a week of original shows. The rest of it is filled with, you know, other things like movies or, you know, you've run your series a number of times, um, but you're only doing a few original shows at one time. In the broadcast world, you're doing 15 or 20 original shows. So in order to replace those shows, you have to make many more pilots, and it just is exponential. So in the broadcast world, we'll, we'll make... We'll make 18 or 20 pilots in a given season, and we'll probably see half of those go to series. So there's a lot of, a lot of waste. On the other hand, it's, there's something nice about making a pilot, and then no one sees it. You know, if it doesn't work, you can just put it away. If you make a movie, you have to release a movie. But pilots, there's a, you know, a fair number of them that, that don't see the light of day, and you know, we make probably mistakes you know, in passing over things that, that could work. But it's a really valuable way to sort of try to figure out what the show is. And, you know, I've always said if you get, if you get the show like 60% right in a pilot, you're, you're doing great. You know, everybody expects pilots to be perfect, but they really are just the first, you know, learning tool as you figure out what the series is. Um, and then in the first season of a new show, there's a lot of experimentation that's done by the writing staff, and you try to figure out what the show is. Nobody knows exactly what it is um, till you get into it. Um, but you know, it's uh, you make a lot of pilots to get to get a hit show. It sounds like if the pilot is like the workshop, then your first season is like our preview period here. Right. That, that's a good analogy. Yeah, because uh, you know I've worked on some shows ranging from you know shows as as sort of different as, you know, The X-Files to, you know, you mentioned Weeds and Dexter um, and, you know, something like The Blacklist. Again, you're, if you're lucky, you get a lot of it right in the pilot. You kind of know where the show's going. But a lot is discovered along the way. That first season of X-Files, which I'm going back, you know, a number of years, there was a lot of discovery to figuring out exactly what that show was. I'm happy to say it's being revived next year by Fox for, I think, an eight-episode order. But, you know, it was a massively successful show. And I would say that first season was a lot of experimentation on the part of Chris Carter, who created it, and, and the writing staff, to figure out exactly what worked and what didn't work. And then, you know, you get the show 
picked up for subsequent seasons and you kind of hopefully perfect it. And then shows grow and morph into different places as they as they go on also. But that's the, I think, excitement of a series. It just keeps living and, and changing. And uh, it's just a really interesting process. It's never, the creative side of it is never finished. It's like the theater. It's like the theater. Well, the theater, you actually lock a show and run it, right? And you can replicate it and duplicate it. And, and there's, there's something nice in that after you figure that you've kind of nailed it. You know, for better or worse, um, and I know a lot of shows they go back in after the fact and tweak it here and there. But for all intents and purposes, you kind of muck around for several years, and then you sort of figure out like, oh, this is it. And if you're lucky enough to have a, a big hit, it can just replicate itself for for decades and decades. Series are always same with a movie. Once you lock a movie, and you have if you have Avatar, it's you know it's the number one movie of all time, and you know, no one's ever going to change that until another big movie comes along. But series are always kind of alive. And you'll hear people complain about the sophomore slump of a show. A new show will sort of hit its stride in the first season and then kind of falter a little bit in the second and then take off again on the third. Think of, you know, a show like Breaking Bad, which that first season was like, how are you going to sustain this math teacher who's got cancer and he starts stealing math? And as you look at where that show went over its seasons, it was extraordinary how they kept unfolding it and growing it. And I don't think the creators of that show, the creator of that show, Vince Gilligan, who I also know, he was an original writer on the X-Files, I don't think he knew when he wrote the pilot what the finale of that show was going to be or what even season three, four, or five was going to be. And that discovery process can really be exciting. And you also have the audience you know, weighing in now and with social media telling you every single thing they think about a show, um, some of which you have to ignore, but, uh, you know, it's a really, it's an exciting process because it's continuing to unfold. And do you and NBC as a whole listen into that social media chatter about the shows and take, we take that into the boardroom and say, this is what people are saying, maybe we should think about this direction? We do. I, I don't think we take it to the boardroom. I think we, we, we listen to it, you know, in terms of marketing and and how shows perceive. Uh, I think the writers and producers of shows really look at it and try to weigh it appropriately. I mean, you obviously you can't listen to everything. You can kind of get a consensus, and if you know if everyone's telling you something is wrong, it's probably a good bet to listen to that and think about it. You know, rarely are you going to find all social media telling you they love everything you're doing. I mean, have you read the theater blogs lately? Um, unfortunately, it's a medium where criticism reigns, and you have to kind of, I think, sift through that. But, you know, it's it's good to get that feedback. You know, we used to do surveys, audience surveys, right? And people would, you know, check boxes and, and write down things and put them in a, in a box at the back of the theater. Um, this is a much more efficient way to do it. If sometimes, you know, frustrating when... T- when you read, you know, some of the, you know, the, the hate watching thing is a phenomenon that is is both disturbing and fascinating to me. But but there you have it. You obviously have a soft spot in your heart for the theater, so I'm sure you have a lot of playwrights coming to you now. And Bob, Bob, I've got an idea for a television show. Do you find that there is a big difference between the playwrights you try to write for television? Can they do it? Is there a difference in style? What does uh, it take? I think there's a lot of differences. I mean, I just think it depends on the individual. You know, it's funny you say there's a lot of playwrights coming to say, oh, I want to write a TV show. Here's the phenomenon that I see happening, which is kind of remarkable, I think. There are lots of TV writers, primarily comedy writers, who are dying to write the books for Broadway musicals. And I don't know what that phenomenon is, but there's a lot of musical lovers in the television world already. And there's something about the fascination of the theater Almost in reverse. Uh, you know, we, of course, are always looking for playwrights and, and writers. You know, any, any great writer with a vision to develop a TV idea. And usually it's good to have them paired with producers who know what they're doing um, and have been through the process before. But I can't tell you how many people want to write Broadway shows. And I tell them either, you know, get ready for the roller coaster ride or run for the hills because there's nothing more frustrating at times but also nothing more thrilling if you're lucky enough to, you know, get it right. 
So speaking of that, you were a producer on Nine to Five several years yes. ago before you got to NBC. Uh, how did that happen? You know, I come from this uh, little town in uh, northern Illinois called Rockford, which spawned a whole bunch of people who work in the theater. There were a lot of community theaters in town, so there were a lot of a lot of us who either went to New York or to LA after college to work in the theater or the movie and TV business. And having done a lot of theater as a kid, you know, I was friends with really good friends with people like Joe Mantello and Mara Maisie, both of whom I went to high school with. And there's a whole long list of other people like Jody Benson and Garrett Griffin and Kevin Stites and the list goes on and on. But a lot of people went to the theater and I went to uh, the TV business. But I always wanted to do something in the theater and I'm a musician to start with so I, I, I loved the musicals ever since I was very young. And I really wanted to work with Joe Mantella who is a really, really dear friend. And you know, I watched all the success of Wicked happen and his whole career. And, you know, he's not interested in doing anything on film. And I, over the years, tried to talk him into doing this show or that show. And he really just is, you know, interested in theater. So I thought, well, you know what, maybe I'll do, I'll try to do some theater. And, uh, you know, I don't know, one day during the, maybe the, the first phase of movies being turned into musicals, which I know is now a very tricky line to walk but you know you sit around and you go you watch an old movie and you go oh that would make a great musical that would make a great musical fortunately or unfortunately they're all now being turned into musicals and many of them aren't great but um i always thought nine to five could be a really fun stage vehicle and it, and it has a musical element built into it with dolly parton's title song so i said to joe wouldn't it be fun to do nine to five as a musical and we both are dolly parton fans and he said to me, if you can get Dolly to write the score, then, then I'm in. I'll, I'll direct it. And, uh, you know, I went about the task of doing that, and the good news is she wanted to do it and was very excited about it. And, um, you know, we just went the distance with it. And uh, it was just a joy to work on. A joy. I remember, I, that's where we met. I remember speaking to you about it, and I remember you just being very joyous about yeah. it. Uh, and you had a nice run here, went on the road. I'm sure it's doing incredibly well in stock and amateur. It is. You know, it, of course, it didn't, it didn't do what we hoped it would do on Broadway. You know, I opened the out-of-town production, a big Broadway-bound production at the Amundsen, the third week in September of 2008. And if you remember what happened in September 2008, the bottom fell out of our economy. And we were like, oh, now what do we do? And, you know, you, at a certain point when you're almost fully capitalized and you have a Broadway theater and the train has left the station, there's nothing you can do. So we opened in April of 2009, and it was tricky. And I don't, I don't think I blame the economy necessarily, but it sure would have helped if the economy wasn't in that state at, at the time. But, uh, you know, we loved doing it. And, you know, I'm working with Dolly now on some things for NBC. To know where it's to love her, there is, there's probably no bigger joy that that I've had in doing nine to five, and you know Joe will probably tell you the same thing. Working with Allison Janney and Stephanie Block and Megan Hilty, that's where I first met Megan, who I eventually put into Smash, and uh, that's where I first met Stephen Remus, who's now working with us on The Wiz, which we're doing live on NBC in December, and. You know, it was just, it was really a joy. I keep using that word, but that's what it was. And it is doing well. You know, there's lots of theaters that want to produce the show because they know the movie. And it's relatively easy to produce. You know, you don't have to build period costumes and, and do any kind of stage pyrotechnics. It's just a really fun and funny musical. In your own personal post-mortem when it was over, and it was a shorter run, of course, than you would have liked, anything you would have done differently? You know, I guess, uh, probably not. I would have probably liked a more intimate theater. But you know what's, what was great about watching that show in the theater with the audience? They would fall out of their chairs with laughter. I mean, it was that rolling, raucous laughter that you don't always hear in a musical. I, what I would have done differently is had a better New York Times review. I mean, I think that's the thing that ultimately did us in. Although... You know, when people went to the show, they came out loving it. 
So you've been such an advocate for the theater in, in your position at NBC and, and doing all sorts of things that seem to be letting the theater and television hold hands, if you will, including, of course, the live telecast of Sound of Music and Peter Pan, and as you mentioned, the upcoming uh, The Wiz. Where did the idea come from for you on this? You know, um, when I first went to Showtime in 2004, one of the first things I did was greenlight a movie based on Reefer Madness, which was a musical also, um, that I think played off-Broadway for a while. I saw it. Um, yeah, and it was a really funny show. Uh, I got to know the creators and Andy Fickman, the director, who's now a big... That was his first film directing job, um, been a theater director. And we had such a blast doing that. And I was very envious. I've been friends with Craig Zagan and Neil Marin for a number of years. And I was always envious of the musicals that they were doing, primarily at CBS or ABC. You know, that Gypsy with Bette Midler I thought was incredibly great. And they did all those Disney, ABC musicals for all those years. I was at the Fox Network during those days, and they really wouldn't have been right for us at Fox, so I kept selfishly trying to figure out, how do I figure out how to do something that would work for the network that I'm running? Showtime was, you know, Reefer Madness seemed like a fun thing to do there. When I got to NBC, Craig and Neil and I were just kicking around ideas, and I think I said to them, I knew about Hugh Jackman's Oklahoma production that he had done in, in the UK many years ago, and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to just go to Hugh and say, do you want to do a new production of you know, Oklahoma, a film? And obviously I figured a big star would help you know, put it across, because you know, I didn't have any idea it would work on a big scale. They said to me, we have a better idea, and it's something we've been wanting to do for a number of years. What about doing Sound of Music live? So it was completely their idea. And I thought to myself, well, how, does, how would that work? How could we even do it? And the learning curve was steep but vast on how to do it. But we just decided, let's try it. And I don't think anybody in the world thought it would deliver 20 million viewers or 19 million viewers and become a kind of phenomenon. And then we figured, well, we did one. You know, let's keep doing them. And the holidays the, seems like the perfect time. We're trying to do these, the family and and uh, so Peter Pan seemed like a really good follow-up to that. And, you know, The Wiz is an enduring... Uh, the Wizard of Oz story works almost any time you do it. You look at Wicked or The Wiz or Wizard of Oz, and it just it seems to be the, the gift that keeps on giving. So we're really excited to be doing, you know, a brand new big production of The Wiz with a new book by Harvey Firestein and a really great cast crosses from pop music to theater, and uh, we're really excited about it. And, you know, at the end of the day, I sort of figure I'm, I'm doing these because I want to do them, and I hope that they bring a big audience. Um, I'm very happy that they, they do. If the first one hadn't done that, we probably wouldn't be doing it. Well, uh, that, yeah. that's what I was thinking about, that first one, because I'm sure, look, you are the boss, so you want to do something. I'm sure you could make that happen, but I'm sure a lot of people there were like, this is a bit scary. How was it for you on set that first you know, night? It's funny. I think everybody thought, what the hell is he doing? But of course no one would say that. And, uh, you know, I just, I didn't really get bogged down in what people think or will it work or not work. We just focused on how to get it off the ground, which was an enormous undertaking. It sounds much simpler than it ultimately is, and these things are very expensive to produce also because you have to, essentially, you have to rehearse and, and put together a full stage musical, and then you have to put it in front of cameras, which is another process. And we figured they've got to be big, they've got to look like movies. I didn't want them to look like filmed plays in a theater because that's what, you know, we used to do those at Showtime and, and HBO, and they... They just felt PBS-like. So we wanted to make them look filmic, which means they had to be bigger. We've learned a lot about how to make it seem bigger but not spend as much money, but they're, they're big. And at the, for Sound of Music, we just said, let's try to figure out how to get it done. Interestingly, you know, there were a lot of actors who were very scared about doing it live. And when we went to Carrie Underwood, who is a live performer primarily, 
she said, oh, I'd love to do it. And it still irks me that she, you know, was, was criticized for her limitations as an actor or as a, as a theater performer. But I loved how she, what she did with the role and the, the fact that she fearlessly jumped into it. You know, nobody really gives her credit for it. So one of the other things, obviously, that you've done that ties into the theater world is the development of Smash. Yes. Uh, uh, so how did the same? How did that come about? Smash was a great, uh, and, and you know, a show which which I love that the theater community has rallied to to, to hate it. You know, many of them, um, and say how inauthentic it was, even though all the people involved had produced Broadway musicals. But that was a wonderful um, experience. Uh, which started at Showtime, uh, Steven Spielberg, who I've gotten to know over the years, called me up one day and said, I've always wanted to do a television series about the making of a, of a Broadway musical. And without even putting the phone down, I said, let's do that. You know, sold. And we had to figure out how it would be created and who would write it and who would do the music and all the millions of details. But we decided to, to embark on the development of it. I left Showtime shortly thereafter, and when I went to NBC, and the coverage was bare, and we were in deep in fourth place at the time. I'm happy to say that we're first place now, and have been for two years. But I was looking around, thinking, how do I? What can I do that's just going to be different and exciting, and you know, going to get the press talking? And I mean, that's one of the reasons for the live musicals, also, press, 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 and excitement. And I thought, I, I bet we could do a version of Smash for NBC that didn't feel dark and cable-y and twisted. And that was it. And Stephen wanted to do it, and everybody, Craig and Neil, were involved um, from the get-go. And uh, we just said, let's do it. Michael Mayer directed it, you know, amazing two-time Tony Award-winning theater director. And Shaman Whitten wrote the music. And we just had a, a blast doing that show. I'm trying to think of what other ideas you're probably cooking up for the theater and, and television. You know, everyone comes to me even saying, well, Ken, why isn't there an American Idol-like Broadway reality show where you find the next so-and-so? Now, there have been a couple Those of Those have been times, done, yes. But and, and NBC did that race, right. right? And I know in the UK they did the Search for Maria for The Sound of Music. We've talked about some of those. I think I'd rather do new ideas than more of those ideas. You know, I'm a little concerned. Once something becomes replicated, it, it's less special. Now Fox is going to do a live Grease in January. And if, if like there is a lot of these live musicals, I'm not sure they're going to be special. So I'm, you know, totally open to, to new ideas. And we talk to, I talk to people like Craig O'Neill and Kevin McCollum and Steven Spielberg all the time about, about what we can do. We've talked about filming some things in a theater and doing those like we used to do it in cable again because nobody's doing that either. But I think, you know, for me it's all about what's a, what's a big event? We're in the event business now because there's so much competition and these tend to be big events if you get them right. Yeah, the, so it's interesting you talk about showing something in a theater. Obviously, the Broadway is trying to crack, I think, the live stream idea and we... Right. London is kicking our ass actually in doing this because the nonprofit institutions are doing it like crazy. The Met obviously does it here, right. and Broadway is wickedly trailing behind. We've done a couple, but no one has ever talked about live streaming onto television. Is that a possibility? Do you think? Could you do a live stream of Wicked? It's actually in the family property, right? I've actually talked to some people on on Broadway with shows that are currently running about doing. Wouldn't be a stream. I mean, you'd film it and doing, you know, either a film of a current Broadway musical or either live or filmed um, in the theater, which is very inexpensive for us to do, which is a good thing because the whizzes and the sound of music are inordinately expensive, and you have to have a huge audience to offset that cost. And it's funny, you still meet with the same resistance. There's one I've been talking to right now, and. They fundamentally believe that if we do a broadcast of the musical, that it will hurt their business. And I just believe that's old-fashioned thinking. I think, yes, there will be some people who say, oh, I saw it on television, why would I buy tickets? But I think the reverse is much bigger. I think there will be so many people who will hear about it for the very first time, maybe not even see it on television, and suddenly be aware of it in the theater. 
And it's much like when the Chicago movie was released. Everybody thought, oh, it's the death knell. Why would you go to the theater production again? And didn't it like inject many more years of life into the stage version of Chicago? I, I don't know that I would do Wicked because Wicked is going to be developed into films and there's still a huge life in Wicked and I think it being exclusive to the stage is, is you know, one of the reasons why it's still such a big hit. But I think there's a number of things, including revivals, that you know have been around for years that could become big films, big television films, and I think they would do nothing but raise the box office excitement of the current production. But you know I can't prove that. So until I get some courageous producers who want to try it, it's going to be hard to, to do that. No one on this podcast can see me raising my hand right now saying, <laughs> I, I'm in for that game. Also, I'm just waiting for David Stone to call me to tell to say, why did I mention Wicked as yeah. possible television? <laughs> Believe me, I don't think Wicked's going to ever be <laughs> put on television before it's turned into a big movie and runs for many more years. But when they do it in the UK, I'm not thoroughly familiar with that, that business, but they're putting in the theaters, right, high-definition streams or broadcasts of the shows that are in the theaters, right? Are they having a detrimental effect on the box office? Are the shows closing once that happens? Are they doing better after that happens? I don't know. You know, I should do some research myself, but clearly it's working there. Well, there's a national tour of Sound of Music about to go out, right, with Jack O'Brien. Yeah. And I, look, Sound of Music is a classic. It's always done every few years, but I would argue that that's going out somebody was reminded maybe we should put it out now because of the success of your of the televised production yes i think you're right and that's good for the rights holders um, but i understand you know if you've got a big show on broadway and it's grossing really well you would be nervous about well what happens if we just let you know a network do a film of it so i would suggest you know you wait long enough into the run I wouldn't do it obviously very early in the run but I think it's a conversation worth having and I am having it and I'm getting some resistance and uh, you know maybe we'll figure it out one day shocking resistance (laughs) from the old guard on Broadway you know we are scared of a lot of things including all the other Mm -hmm. ways to consume entertainment in two dimensional forms and oh my gosh it's the death of Broadway now because we can see movies at home and on our phones etc do you have any advice for us on how to compete with that, even though you're on the other side at times? We live in the same fear. I'm telling you, the television business has never been more challenged because of the ability to move programming over to many different devices. And <clears throat> we depend on, our, our whole business depends on advertising revenue, which is challenged if you can take a show and watch it with no advertising. And that happens all the time. And I think you can either be scared of it and, and worry about it and, and not do anything, or you can embrace it and try to figure out, well, let's be clever and creative. I don't have advice for anybody. All, all, I'm, all I'm trying to do in my business to, to keep ahead of all of the technology is continue to come up with things that feel like events. And the, the more it feels compelling, and it's an old phrase, but it's everything old is new again. The more it feels must-see, the better chance you have of it being successful in, in any form that it's viewed. You know, we just premiered this big new show starring Neil Patrick Harris, which is live, and it's a big event with a live audience and did really well behind another big event show called America's Got Talent. And I just think, keep on trying to figure out what's an event. And, you know, don't just depend on titles of movies to to sort of drive your awareness, but, you know, that can help too. Okay, so my last question, which is uh, my infamous genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin (laughs) knocks on your office door and says, Bob, you've done such a great job. The live telecast, I've loved them. You're really building a bridge between Broadway and and Hollywood. I want to thank you for that. I'm going to grant you one wish. What's the one thing that drives you so crazy about the Broadway environment or community or how business is done that would keep you up at night? Maybe it was on 9 to 5. Maybe it's as a theater goer <laughs> now. What's the one thing that you hate? You seem like a very even keel, very nice genteel man. What would get you so mad about what happens here that you'd wish away? I, 
I would wish away the bad reviews, even if they're warranted. I just think let the public find the show themselves and figure out if they want to go to it. I think a few people's opinions, which drive business, you know, either to the theater or away, are more damaging than I think anything. And I, I think let the show just, you know, great reviews. It's great to sort of blow the box office up, but let the box office blow up because, you know, people talk about it. That that would be my one wish. I, I happen to be a very lucky little investor in a new show called Hamilton. Never which, heard of it. Yeah. Never heard of it. Which uh, I had nothing to do with. I can claim no credit for any of the artistic achievement of it. But didn't need didn't need a great review. And, you know, I guess a bad review wouldn't wouldn't have hurt it. But I don't know what that serves the audience or the creative community anymore. It may have been important, you know, 50 or 100 years ago when the theater was was new and, and growing, but I don't think it's relevant anymore. Television, it's not Same really. Same thing. I don't, think they're, I don't think they're relevant ever, anywhere. In television, they don't matter because, you know, at least in broadcast, there's no purchasing decision that, you know, is going to be affected by a yay or a nay. We use the reviews because it helps in marketing, but I don't know that a great review really ever did anything. What does is incredible word of mouth, which is the classic, you know, and certainly what has driven Hamilton from that first workshop of Act One. People started talking about it. But yeah, movie reviews, does anybody read a movie? Uh, not to mention that, you know, most reviews are 100 words. Are they 100 words? You know, you get three sentences of what the story is and then three descriptive sentences. And then is that a review? And then a grade. I'm not sure it serves any purpose. It's nice to have a little marketing blip in whatever publication you're in, but I think there's more creative ways to accomplish that too. Yeah, it's just my mind is being blown right now because I don't see television shows trumpeting their great reviews like we have to trumpet. <laughs> You know what we do? Show. We do in we do in cable more than we do in broadcast because cable is a purchasing decision. You know when, and it's it's less than what it used to be ten or twenty years ago. When you bought HBO or Showtime for the first time, that was a that was a lot of money compared to, you know, now your cable bill is two hundred dollars a month. Your cable bill used to be forty or fifty, and and Showtime was ten dollars, and HBO was twelve or fifteen dollars. That was a lot. So. It kind of made sense to say The Sopranos is the greatest show ever to have come along if you're trying to drive subscriptions and get people to actually make a purchase. And I guess that's what is happening in the theater. But I would say, you know, we have so many other ways to now drive ticket sales and get word of mouth out there. I mean, I don't know where the great law was ever written that there needed to be criticism of anything. Let the world just play out, you know, on its own terms. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it, it is what it is. It'll probably never change. But uh, that's the one thing I think if we got rid of it tomorrow, it would be sort of like lifting this heavy blanket off of everyone's shoulders, if only psychologically. It would certainly create a much more freer art without a doubt if we didn't have that pressure on. Uh, well, I want to thank you so much for being here today, Bob. But more importantly, I want to thank you for your incredible efforts on building this bridge between our two related mediums. I firmly believe that everything you're doing at NBC is actually one of the greatest marketing weapons that Broadway has right now because you speak to so many people. And someone asked me the other day why I thought Broadway was booming at this very moment. And I actually think that it's because of a seed that Disney planted about 20 years ago. And 20 years from now, when we are booming... I honestly believe they're going to say it's what Bob Greenblatt was doing at NBC and what he started. So thank you for all of that. Well, that's very nice of you to say. I, I think, you know, I, I do think putting these shows on a national platform uh, helps. So if that's bleeding into ticket sales and helping the business in general, that's, that's great. Well, you're helping to create a whole new generation of theater goers out there that I know will eventually come here to see it in person and live. I know when I was a kid, what I looked forward to was annual airing of The Wizard of Oz and The Sound of Music, and you couldn't get them anywhere else at the time. So we really looked forward to those, and it's 
one of the things that made me want to go into the business. And uh, if this is that for kids in you know Iowa or Montana or Arizona who don't have access to Broadway, then that would be a great thing. For sure. Uh, thanks again, Bob. Thanks to all of you for listening. Make sure you subscribe. Next week, we've got one of Broadway's biggest hit makers on the podcast, director, choreographer of Aladdin, Book of Mormon, and a whole lot more, Casey Nicola. So tune in then. Thanks again. I'm gonna be a producer.